Thanks, Tim. Okay, and launch that poll. Now, Brian, just for most folks here, how, how important is SharePoint for PowerPivot? Why, what's the connection between them two, the two of them? Well, a, a PowerPivot documents can be deployed to SharePoint so, and, and, and collaborated with that way. So without, uh, you need SharePoint? Without to... that, so without, you don't have to have SharePoint, no. Right. So okay. what are we showing today mostly is the, is the Excel side, not the SharePoint side. All right. Looks like a lot of people how often to use SharePoint. We've got an awful lot that are never, and uh, uh, a few that are 25% or less. So that's good that you don't need SharePoint for, the, for Power Pivot. Uh, I'll go ahead and close that and share it with everybody. Okay, give you all a sense of how you measure up with your, uh, your colleagues in the community. It looks like we're just getting over a couple hundred people now, so that's cool. Another good session. Uh, and then the second question is, what version of Excel do you currently use? We'll launch that. And Brian, while they're doing that, I'll go ahead and... Uh, well, actually, I, I, I've actually run into that before with changing the polls while changing presenter is not a good thing. <laughs> All right, we have 84% answered that, so let's go ahead and close that out and share it with everybody. Looks like many of you are using 2007 or the latest 2010 beta, which is good, because you need that PowerPivot plugin in 2010, right, Brian? Is that uh, correct? Exactly. Yeah. All right, share that with everybody. I'll hide those. All right. I'm not going to make Brian. It. I'll make you presenter, Brian. And stay on until we can see your screen. That right, comes through refreshing okay. right now, Tim. Let me, uh... All right. So, Brian, what kind of skin treatment go. do you Everything use to stay kind of looking so young here? I mean, I'm looking at your. Uh, Slide here. Is it oil of Olay? Or? <laughs> I gave you all my old pictures. What? <laughs> all right, I see it. It's all I up and running. I gave you all my old pictures is what, what happens. So. <laughs> uh, talk oh, to you and I'm actually broadcasting the wrong screen here also. Thank you. Okay, oh, yeah, guys. Welcome, out. guys. So let me uh, actually make sure I'm going the right screen. There we go. Okay. Tim, I come through okay? Yep, coming through just fine. Everything's, I can see it well and hear you loud and clear. All right, sounds good. Well, well, guys, welcome to the uh, session here. What we'll be talking about today is mostly around. <laughs> I tend to like comments about uh, 2010 not being beta. It is, yeah, it's been it's been uh, GA for quite some time now, so um, that's okay. Uh, so what we'll be talking about today is actually all stuff that's not beta, actually live stuff. Um, we unfortunately, my environment will not work for the SharePoint today. It's actually at capacity, so I couldn't uh, sign into the SharePoint environment. So we're going to focus mostly on the Excel portion. Uh, so we won't, we won't be, probably will not use a whole full hour. But I'll probably use about, about you know 40, 40 minutes of it uh, just to kind of give us a, a nice lunch uh, lunchtime session. So I'm going to focus first of all on the Power Pivot plugin for Excel. I'll go. I'll do everything but deploy it to SharePoint. I normally would cover some of the, uh, the installation of SharePoint pieces. Uh, Adam had a great session last week on SharePoint, if you'd like to see that piece also. We'll also cover the DAX language a little bit, the uh, data expression language. And then we'll cover like, what, what types of things can we do inside of this, and what's the general architecture for PowerPivot also. Uh, well, good morning. My name is Brian Knight. Uh, my email address is on the screen right now. <coughs> and then today we're going to uh, oh, ready to go. There it is, my mouse. Today I want to start a little different way today. I want to start first of all with a little story. And you know, most technical sessions I, you know, I start with like a, uh, you know, a plethora of 150 slides. Today I'm going to start a little lighter. So we all heard a story like this today when we were, you know, when we were uh, in IT. Now, this is a very, very, actually it's a real story that uh, I was told from a CIO recently. So once upon a time there was an HR manager, uh, for, for lack of, uh, for lack of uh, you know, uh, for lack of names here, I'll, I'll call him Tim Mulek for names. Uh, I'll call him a sales manager also, just kind of make it uh, very, very easy here. So once upon a time, I had a, there was a sales manager called Tim Mulek. And he approached IT about building a report, building a set of systems and reports around making the pricing of the products much easier. So classic IT, you know, we were busy, got things going on, so classic IT, uh, we told him, no, 
because we're, you know, it doesn't fit the priorities of what we have. We had a big migration going on, or something was 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 keeping us busy, so we couldn't do that. So so Tim couldn't get his pricing reports that he was looking forward to. So he got the no that he's looking forward to. Now, like any good sales manager who's very very aggressive, Tim decided to do it anyways. So he decided to go ahead and create these reports anyways, and he was successful. He, people started using these reports and these to do their pricing of products to see which pr products were being used by which top customers, and he started getting a lot of momentum and a lot of success. Now, because of that, things were going all great until one day, Tim got laid off. Tim, I meant to, we have a meeting after this, right? So we'll be talking later. So Tim got laid Ouch. off, was escorted out the door. <laughs> this is an awkward way to tell you, I know, Tim, but uh, <laughs> so after he got laid off, IT got this call. Sales guys couldn't get the reports they wanted. So IT get this, got this, get this, gets this call, and this is actually a real story from the CIO was telling me. He said he got a call on a Sunday morning and from a very, very frustrated salesperson saying, I need my report. Well, I can't do my job without this report. And he's like, what report? And I'm sure this has happened to you guys a lot, right? Whether it be an access database, whether it be an Excel spreadsheet or some kind of report that's kind of a rogue report, you don't know about it. And all of a sudden, there's 500 people using this report, and all of a sudden, when the layoff happens, they're, they're kind of holding their back. So in comes IT to save the day. Um, they, they eventually figure out where the report is, solve the problem, and get, get the 500 users back up. Well, do you see the problem here? The problem is really around you've got to have your users get the access to the data they need. Our IT can't be everywhere for all things. We're not quite omnipotent. We're, we're close to it, but not quite. So we can't be everything to all people. So there's some projects we're going to tell no to. But the, you know, a resourceful sales manager, a resourceful HR person, or a finance person is going to get the data they want somehow. They're going to get that report up. So what Power Pivot's all about is giving the data to the people that need it and then helping them facilitate those reports. And then once it gets to the point where 500 people are using this report, helping facilitate that migration from Power Pivot over to a proper cube. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. Hey, and, I, and Bob actually called me out on the IT crowd. I love that show. Uh, thanks, Bob, for catching that. You're one of the only people that ever caught that, by the way, Bob. All right, so a little bit myself. I am a uh, SQL Server MVP out of Jacksonville, Florida, <coughs> and uh, where, where it's quite rainy today, like I'm sure the rest of America. And uh, well, I'm the founder of Pragmatic Works. A long time ago, about three years ago, we founded Pragmatic Works to really be a BI company focused on software and consulting and and uh, training also around BI. I've also authored 13 uh, SQL Server books. Um, most of them are on IS, a few on AS as well. And I blog on a website called BIDN.com. It's a BI developer network, by the way. Okay? That's right. I forgot that it's a, that's a UK program, isn't it? It's on the BBC. Until it, until it shut down. Uh, anyways, the, uh, today we're going to talk about how, we, how do we load a Power Pivot document, how do we design it afterwards, how do we enhance that document with additional data, and then lastly, how do we publish that to SharePoint? We're going to stop at the publishing a SharePoint piece. Normally, I would actually cover the configuration of SharePoint also. So I'll focus mostly on the, the pieces of the puzzle that are, that are Excel-based. So let's get started. So first of all, why do we even build a data warehouse? So <clears throat> there's a reason why this slide is in here. The reason why it's in here is, it we'll cover in a second, but mainly we build data warehouses to optimize our reporting, right? Let's say I have Bob or have a Tim as a sales manager. He doesn't want to go to 15 tables to get information about his product SKUs. He wants to see maybe one or three tables that has a hierarchy, has a snowflake of, 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 of his data. So it, be, it makes it very, very simple to report against for Tim. Less, less joins, less, nor, less normalization, and also, let's say, for example, our HR data is typically on DB2, and our inventory data is typically in SQL Server, and maybe our e-commerce is in Oracle. So we have all these systems that are kind of disparate all throughout the system, all throughout our environment. And there are companies out there that spend four or five days just writing one report that let you know how they did at the end of the month. So data warehouses kind of bring all that data together to make it much easier. 
It also helps you archive data. So in the mortgage industry, you've got to hold mortgage data for seven years after a foreclosure happens. So there's a lot of archival data nowadays. It also helps us consolidate that data together also, which is what I mentioned before. So if that's so great, if it's so much better to do a data warehouse, then why has BI become a bad word? Well, and generally speaking, BI has become a bad word because a lot of projects fail. They take on too big of a scope. They try to accomplish too many things at one time. So that's one of the areas that Power Pivot really helps in. It's going to help with agile development. It's going to help a, a self, create a self-service BI environment for your end users. So in other words, what it's going to do is my users now can drag and drop their own reports. They can deploy it to SharePoint and get the answers they need with or without a data warehouse. Data warehouses surely help things, but if you have some data in DB2, some data in SQL Server, and some data on a web page, all that data can be merged together with Power Pivot. It also helps you mash loosely related data. So let's say, for example, we want to take weather data or data about our competitors and put it all into the same report. That can be done also with Power Pivot. So it's basically creating a cube without a full data warehouse. Now you can have a data warehouse, and that will help your users, but it doesn't have to, you don't have to have one in this case. So the benefit to you as a BI organization is your users now are kind of defining the requirements for your next iterations of data warehouses. So now they kind of create their own reports, kind of reducing your report backlog, and as, as they define this report, it becomes more and more important, you can move that over to the data warehouse, reducing your chance of failure on the BI project. Okay? So what will I need to begin? So all you're going to need is what the two items you see on the screen now. You need Excel 2010, and you need a Power Pivot free plugin. Now, the fastest way to get that is to go to PowerPivot.com, but you can also get it from the Microsoft website. This is a free plugin, and it's constantly being improved. Now, the Excel 2010 piece, you can have the 32-bit or the 64-bit version. Again, as, as uh, somebody pointed out earlier, this has already been released. It's not a beta product. Nothing's beta about what we're showing today. Now, this is improving a lot over the next few versions, and you're going to see a lot of enhancements even over service packs for this as well. So they, they, they try to get as much as they could in the product, and they, they still miss a mark on a few things, so they're improving it a lot over the next few iterations. Can't quite cover what they're going to improve on but because uh, of NDAs, but uh, trust me, it's going to get a lot better. Now, basically what this is is it's a small version of analysis services living inside of Excel. There's no actually analysis services service, but it's basically the, the code that really makes analysis services churn, something called VertiPack that kind of helps, helps you slice and dice. It's basically embedding that logic into Excel. So now it hyper-compresses the data and allows you to slice and dice. So in other words, it basically takes all the benefits, all the R&D for the past 10 years has gone into analysis services and gives your users the ability to do that without having that cube now. All right, so it gives us a lot of good stuff. So if that's good, then why SharePoint then? So the next step is, after your user has that great report, we can deploy this, uh, oh, will it only work? Yeah, some good questions here already. Um, <laughs> engine of the devil, I like that. The uh, VertiPack is the engine of the devil. So the uh, uh, the Excel 2010, it does only work in 2010 at this point. Uh, it's under 2007 at this point. Um, yes, yeah, so there's a number of uh, ways we'll be updating it. One is through service packs through auto update, and one is going to be through uh, Power Pivot updates as well. So this, this will be benefits on both sides. Uh, I, I believe the auto updates can take care of all that for you. You'll also see updates when, when they start releasing up Nolly as well. Three great questions. All right, so we've got this, this, this great report already now developed. And how do we now get get this? Uh, how do I email this to you? Well, there's two options I can do. I can email the spreadsheet to you. Now, if I email the spreadsheet over to Poor Silva, uh, she is going to have this huge spreadsheet, maybe 20, 30 megs in size, and it's going to clog my Exchange server. So another option is to take this and ultimately deploy it over to SharePoint. And SharePoint makes this much, much more efficient to do this. So SharePoint will basically mean my 
analysis services is crunching these numbers and doing all that work for me. So now, I don't even have to have Excel now. All I need is a web page, and, it's, and it, SharePoint does all the crunching, all the, the, the services behind that, that, that analysis services piece. So I can create a, a power pivot farm, basically, which is basically an analysis services engine, and SharePoint basically passes queries over to it, says crunch these numbers, it churns the numbers, and sends you back the data. All right, so what do you need to configure this? Well, you'll need uh, to, to do the SharePoint piece. Now, keep in mind, these are mutually exclusive. So to do a power pivot, you do not need SharePoint. But if you want to deploy it to SharePoint, well, that's when, it, that's when you'll need some other stuff. So if I want to deploy this to SharePoint, I will need SharePoint 2010, and that's going to be Enterprise Edition of 2010. And you'll need SQL Server 2008 R2 Enterprise Edition also. So enterprise edition of all SKUs in this case. Uh, you'll need to make sure that your, your SharePoint environment is using a domain. You can't use a local box, in other words. That's why my laptop doesn't have SharePoint for PowerPivot installed. And then you're all set off to the races. There's lots of good, lots of configuration around this also. I'm only covering the top tip of the iceberg on the SharePoint piece here. But there's lots of stuff that we can cover on this. All right, enough, enough of this. I have a few questions here. Um, and then we'll get, get into our demo. So. Uh, Question here from Jorge, uh, X60, okay, so 32-bit versions versus 64-bit versions. It will work on any 32 and 64-bit version power pivot will. The challenge is uh, you're going to be crunching a lot of numbers, and a 64-bit box will really, really help you in this case. It's, it is hard, at least in the U.S., to buy 32-bit 32 32 laptops anymore. Uh, generally, they might have the 32-bit OS installed, but a 64-bit laptop with the 64-bit OS will definitely help you with Power Pivot. Um, so another one here, Bob, I know you don't have I know you don't have SharePoint today, but if you have, uh, will you another one, yes, another session we'll cover a lot, a lot more on SharePoint piece. In fact, I have one recorded already. So I'll, I'll try in the, in the background to get it up and running also. Okay, uh, Pam is asking, will it work on SQL Server 2008 Standard Edition? Unfortunately, you have to have Enterprise Edition on the, on the AS side, okay? Uh, Dave here is asking a question. You lost me. Is analysis services do, uh, does Excel on your PC, and or does it? All right, it's a good question here. So this, this is the this is the big difference here. All right, so let's kind of zoom in here. Let me kind of draw a little bit of architecture. Let's whiteboard this. So there's really two types of, of configuration here, right? So in this case, I just have Excel open here. All right, 2010. And I'm crunching numbers, and I'm getting data from a database, perhaps. I have a terrible drawing here, Dave, sorry. Um, so I, I, I get data from a database here, et cetera. And it's all bringing this data over from wherever my data source into Excel. And what's happening is there's actually a DLL, uh, pro, a little DLL file in here, which is doing all my crunching for me. So all the work is happening in Excel right now. So there's nothing you have to install on the server side. Everything's on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the, uh, the client side in this case. Now, what changes when I'm going to switch it to blue here is when I want to go over to SharePoint. Okay, so let's go over to SharePoint here. All right, so Dave, I want to deploy this to SharePoint so I can, I can share this with you now at this point. And this is a little confusing at first. So when I deploy this to SharePoint, I have all my sad-looking users right here. Sorry, I can't draw very well here. But I have all my sad-looking sad users in the cloud here. And they're all coming, coming into SharePoint to see that, that, that Power Pivot document that you've deployed to SharePoint. At this point, Excel is out of the picture. Everything is a service-based architecture at this point. So in this case, I've got a number of analysis services, 2008 R2 boxes. And it's not that bad. Is it? Oh, almost. I almost had it. All right. There we go. All right. So I've got some. I got two AS boxes up here. I'll call this AS1 and AS2. These are analysis services, 2008 R2 boxes, and they're enterprise edition. So Dave, what's happening is when, when a user comes in to see a Power Pivot document in SharePoint, not Excel, but in SharePoint, what's happening now is SharePoint takes the data that's living in SharePoint, the, the raw data, and I'll show this to you in a second, it uploads it to one of these AS instances right here. And it basically creates a cube on the fly. It then processes a cube. And then it's re it readies it. 
In other words, it's, it, sorry, I misspelled that, but it, uh, it readies it, it says everybody's ready to come. Now at this point, once the cube is ready, my, my, uh, my web page inside of SharePoint can slice and dice that, that Power Pivot document, but it's actually hitting a server behind the scenes, a server right here behind the scenes. So what I mean by that is now I, I as a user, can actually see the cube in Management Studio. It's ready, it's live, it's hot. And eventually that cube gets aged out as it gets older. But so basically what you're seeing in red here is the classic client architecture. Nothing to install on the server side. The blue area is an area once I want to deploy this to the server. Hopefully they, David answered your question, I hope. And I'm going to show a demo to kind of get you going here also. All right. It is a little confusing at first. So yeah, so if, if you use SharePoint, it, to keep on, everything is Enterprise Edition for Power Pivot, at least, uh, on, the, on the server side, on the analysis server side. But to do Power Pivot on the Excel side, no, nothing, on the, nothing on the server required at all. I've got about four gigs of, on my laptop here, um, but I've seen this done, what I'm about to show you, on a netbook also. So, I mean, it, you know, it require, it, it, I would recommend higher amount of memory resources, but it doesn't require that. So let's, let's, let me show you what I mean here. Let me show you kind of a completed version of it first, and then we'll kind of work backwards here. I want to show kind of a, a fancier version, and then we'll hop forward to how we actually produce this also. All right. So you're actually going to see a lot more investment in this as well. So the investment is going to come in. Um, here we go. Let me actually open up. Here we go. And I had one already open. So here, let's see. Let me uh, code and oh. Demo K. Sorry, I had it right in, my, right in front of me here. There it is. Okay. So this is an example of a K through 12, a, a, high, a high school kind of analysis here. So we're analyzing all, this, all, of, all of our schools. So a quick question here about from James here about how I deploy this without SharePoint. We can put these spreadsheets on the network share. We can, we can email them still. There's lots of ways we can do this with this. So this is what, what a Power Pivot document looks like. And you'll notice is as I select different schools here, like Park Lane and Elementary, it's actually running. You'll see a running OLAP query right here. It's actually running a, an MDX query behind the scenes. So what we'll, so we'll see is as I start to select, let me say like grade six here, for example, Notice that some of my areas, now that I set to grade six, have grayed out. So you'll see that right here, these two right here, for example, and these right here, which is, of course, great because grade six is, six is uh, deselected. So what this is telling us is that in, for grade six, we did not have any grade six in our database between 2005 and 2006. So it helps, it helps ultimately my users not select something that you know, that is, that is no correlation between. So if I select 2006, I would expect to see all this data blank out because there's no correlation at all. You can also multi-select these and you can say, I want to see just these, these teachers right here and how, this, how their different classes look for these teachers right here. So this is kind of showing us how their attendance is. So I'm going to pick a given teacher here. There we go. This teacher only has only certain data in their, in their, in their cube. So as you can see, we're able to pick a lot of the data. I can also unfilter the data. And we're going to get we're going to get into the data part in, in next now. I just want to kind of show you what the front end looks like first. Show you the end result first, and then we'll come back and ultimately get to the good the good stuff. All right. So again, there's nothing. Uh, okay. So, cause oh, the questions here. What does under underlying data look, look like? That's what we're getting to right now, Dave. So a whole bunch of good questions here. All right. So let's get to our first one here. Let me close this first spreadsheet. And I'm going to open up a spreadsheet here. I've got one here already called. Oh, I thought I had it open already. Must have closed it by accident. All right, so I'm going to open up this one here called Power Pivot Demo. You'll find this demo on my blog. It has nothing in it except for this raw data right here. So we'll cover this in a second. But all it is is just a, a plain old spreadsheet. All the data you need is on my blog at bidn.com. Also, again, the recordings for this are also going to be on the web uh, later today, so you'll be able to watch this, this again and kind of play along at home. So the first thing I'm going to do, you'll notice after I've installed the plugin, I have this new icon here called the Power Pivot Plugin window. And I click on that, and it opens up the Power Pivot area. Now, you know that classic Excel can only hold a certain amount of rows. Now, the nice thing about this Power Pivot window here is those rules have kind of changed. 
So, okay, yep, and again, the question, question about from about the AS, a lot of confusion about the AS piece here. If you don't, if you don't expect to deploy this to SharePoint, you will not need an AS instance at all. So that's just a good, a good question here. I, I got asked about three or four times. I figure it's probably a good time to restate that. So I'm going to get data from a database, or I can get, which includes, by the way, for the person asking you right now, uh, Ashish, you can also connect to a cube here you saw. So we can connect to a cube. We can connect to Access, SQL Server, but that's just a few of the resources. We can also connect to reporting services here if you wanted to as well. I can point to my reporting services server, connect to that data, and it actually sucks that sales data down as a, a, a real data source, which is kind of handy. Now, it basically uses O data to do that. Now, look at this also. We can hit other data feeds right here, which are basically O data feeds on the web. Um, so, for example, let's see, I actually have an example one right over here. Let me kind of suck this data down real quick. This is going to be, uh, I think this is like some, some data from the uh, government here. I'll pick my other data sources right here. So that's where is it at? There it is. I just pasted the, the OData feed in. Hit next. And the web service is going to make a call out. Suck the data down after it shows me kind of a preview of it. And pop it right into my spreadsheet. This is just one of the data sources. There we go. It's getting the data feed right now. I'll call this uh, my data. I'll hit OK. Notice I can also filter the data as well, which is one of the really nice, strong pieces of it. So as the, as the data is coming in, it applies a client-side filter to this as well. Really, really handy. So in this case, I've, lo I've loaded seven, 679 rows. There's my data right here. You'll see my row count right here. So yes, it looks like an Excel spreadsheet, but it's not really an Excel spreadsheet. Notice I can't edit any of these fields. If I start typing over these, I can't actually edit these. It's a read-only view of the data. And it's a point-in-time image of the data also. So as soon as my, my web service is starting to change, my data starts to become stale. So to do that again, I hit the refresh button again. I can go out and get the latest version. So my next piece I want to do, I want to bring some data from a database. Now notice when I go to other data sources, what I have here. So I can go to Azure, I can go to PDW, I can go to Access, but I can also go to all the data sources that you typically see out there. Teradata, Sybase, Informix, DB2, and, and, and SQL Server, of course, and Oracle as well. Uh, you can also pull from other Excel spreadsheets, some text files, from reporting services reports, and from a cube. All those things all apply. In my case, I'm just going to go over to SQL Server. I'm going to point to my instance here. Okay, hit the drop-down box here. Now, this would be a power user role in this case. It wouldn't be a DBA typically doing this. It would be you training your users how to do this for the most part. And you're, you're, a lot of people I know, a lot of finance guys I know that are not, that are not power users are actually doing this pretty well. So I'm going to hit next. I'm going to go to my AdventureWorks database, DW database. And as you can see, I can, I can actually write a query against this data right here. Or I can point to tables as well. So my power users aren't going to be technically savvy enough to write queries. So what they can do is they can go over to my, my tables here. They can say, well, I know I want to analyze internet sales. They can select that, hit show related tables. Now because there's referential integrity behind those tables, it was smart enough now to add six more tables. So if I go back over here, you'll see it grab promotion, it grabbed a few other things. Let me add on top of that, let me add product category and subcategory also. All right. Now, you'll notice I can also hit preview and filter. If I'm a sales manager now, like Tim, I can hit the drop-down box, and I can deselect certain products, and it would actually filter those for me automatically. This is basically applying a, a, a client-side where clause to the data as it's being brought down. Now, I'm going to hit next, or finish. Now, keep in mind, it found those relationships because I had referential integrity in the database. If you do not have referential integrity, it's not a problem. We're going to do this a different way, and I'm going to show you the different way in a moment here. Okay, so I close this data down. Now, notice that I have fact internet sales, and I have 60,000 rows. So watch how fast I can sort this data. So if I want to see the data by, how about shift date key? And I'm going to order this data from smallest to largest. Now, watch how fast this is. Ready? Start counting now. It's done. So that was 64,000 rows, which is a pretty paltry amount of rows. Let me open up a larger bank of data here. So when I go over to here, uh, I'm going to select this customer key, for example. 
I'll hit the drop down box or any of these numbers will be the same thing. I'll, I'll, do, I'll do a date here as well. So I'll pick a date. I will do oldest to newest. Ready? Ready count? Go. Done. Now in this case, we loaded 12 million rows that fast. So you may be wondering, well, how in the world is it doing that? Because SQL Server can, can order 12 million rows fairly fast, pretty fast, really fast. But 12 million rows, and I picked an arbitrary column here. I picked this one, do the same thing. It's just as fast. Less than one second to, do, to sort that. So I can pick any column, customer key, whatever. Ready? Go. And the reason why it's so fast, because the data has been hyper-compressed in memory. So much like analysis services does, the data has been compressed. The same thing's happening here. So what's happening is the data is, is less than a 1 to 10 ratio. It's actually a 95, 98% ratio in many cases. So that, that helps you immensely compress this data. So let me show you what I mean. So ultimately, when I bring this over, let me go over to my C drive and under demo somewhere here. This Excel spreadsheet, what I have right here, it's about, uh, this database is about uh, 700 megs in an Excel spreadsheet. That was I was ordering. Now, in reality, the, the data behind that is over 10 gigs in size on my server. So it's ultimately compressing that data way, way down around that. Okay? So it allows you to kind of get past those Excel limits. Now, these have seen an interesting question here about modeling. So is there any other kind of mining models or algorithms around this? So there's an interesting article on the homepage of SQLServerDataMining.com that is all around doing data mining inside of this. Also an interesting question about vertical, the, the vertical database, the VertiPack. That's basically what we're doing here is, a very, is, a, is kind of like a VertiPack, the vertical database, which is kind of like a NoSQL kind of thing. Anyways, the, the new release of analysis services, Denali is called, will have a lot, lot more of this built into the release. So we'll see a lot more of good stuff around that coming out as well. So Power Pivot is a great investment in your time to learn because you're going to see a lot more of it in future builds. Okay, so let me go ahead and close this. This is my, my online sales. Let me close this. And let's go back to our AdventureWorks one instead, the one that you can replicate in your environment. Okay, so what we have, we have, we have sales. Those sales have products. Those products have subcategories, and those subcategories have categories. Now, there's a relationship in place here that we cannot see. And the relationship's in place because the foreign keys behind the scenes allowed it. <clears throat> so if I go over to design and I hit manage relationships, you'll see the foreign keys right here. Now, a few rules about the foreign keys. The first rule is only a one column to another column rule. So you can only have, you can't have a concatenated key around that. It also does not handle things like role-playing dimensions, which if you're a data warehouse person, you'll recognize that. That would be something like order date and ship date and due date. We have three different date keys that are representing the same thing. So it really much handles a one-to-one -one ratio right now. Now I'm going to come back to this tab a little bit later, but notice that right now all these keys are already enabled. We're going to create one manually a little bit later. Okay, so let's create our first report. <clears throat> so I'm going to go over to home. I'm going to go to pivot table, and I'm going to do a pivot table. Now keep in mind, we have no cube in this case. I'm going to do a new worksheet. Our doll's doing existing worksheet. What the heck? Okay. Now, what I'm going to do in this case, I want to figure out my sales. So look at that. I have my, my data here. And most people get a lot of data in this. So what I can do is I can search for something like fact in, or I want to see my sales amount here. Sales amount. Hit enter. There she blows. I can check sales amount. I'll see this. I've got some formatting issues right now, so let me make that a dollar figure instead. All right. Now, if I click back inside of that, you'll re if you've done a cube before, you'll recognize the tab I'm in. It looks a lot like a pivot table, doesn't it? So I can select, just like in a pivot table, I can select things like categories. So if I look at uh, English product category name, there we go. How about uh, some subcategories instead also? Okay, it's going to be like a subcategory name as well. Let's get the English one. And then lastly, I'll put some kind of date on this. I want to do some filtering on dates. Now, I have the classic filtering that you have, but I also want to get some other data as well. So I'm going to go to dim date, and I want to filter based on year. So I'll drag down my years down this slicer area that you see right here. I'll let go. And it's going to create this slicer that you see over on the left here. 
I can also drag things like uh, different currencies or maybe I want to see this by customer of some sort. So let me do this by marital status of customers. There we go. So as you can see, we're building a pretty nice report, the education amount for those customers. There we go. So as I start to select this, uh, I can go over here and I can say, you know, I'm personally kind of anal about my reports. I don't like grid lines, so I'll remove the grid lines. I can put things like my logo up top, all those kind of things to make it fancier. I can, I can of course, you know, do some nice little table formatting baked into Excel. Obviously, it's not an Excel piece here. But as I select, I want to see my married people. How do my sales look for my married people? Notice that all the numbers refresh pretty immediately. It's not bad for something that's all running client side, is it? I can also do multi-select. I can pick uh, 2006 sales for married people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, it, and I can unfilter all these by hitting this little unfilter button. So, so far, so good. <clears throat> We're getting some interesting data out of this. Now, the next thing I want to do, though, is I want to bring some data that has no relation at all to this, which is really the power of Power Pivot. So to do that, what I'm going to do, let me do more check here, and open, open the side while I'm thinking of this. Okay. All right. I'm going to try to start up my SharePoint instance one more time. I, I think it's fully utilized right now, so I can't get in there right now. So the other thing that, because I, I have a lot of SharePoint questions in the background. Um, so next question, what, what, what is this? Uh, so what can we do in analysis services that Power Pivot can't do? What a great question. So there are a lot of things around calculations. It's going to scale a lot better. So the reason why we do analysis services is for scalability. So storing all this on the server hot, ready to go, and it's going to scale a lot better than, than Power Pivot will. Uh, most of what we can do in Power Pivot, though, we can do inside of, uh, sorry, most of what we do inside of analysis services can be done inside of Power Pivot. There's exceptions to that, like KPIs, like actions, things like that. But for the most part, most things that we do over in one area can be done here as well. All right, so let's bring some data together. What I have over here, what my user has requested is the ability to see, well, I want to see how my sales are by temperature. Okay, so I'm going to select some data here. Now, this temperature is data that's been, and this, you can get it somewhere on my blog also, is data that basically narrows down by region how many, uh, how, how the average temperature is by region. So is it a cold day or a warm day, and how are my sales doing for cold days or warm days? So if I go over to my report and back to the Power Pivot area, okay, this time I'm just going to paste in data. Hit the paste icon on the top left, and I'll call this temps. Okay, this temperature table that I'm creating now is inside of Power Pivot also. Now, as you can imagine, it has no relationship at all to my core data. So if I went back over to my Excel area, let me go back real quick, and I want to bring in temperature data. Notice that first of all, it says the power pivot data was modified. So I hit the refresh by icon, and then my temps area is now available somewhere at the bottom. So I want to see how the average temperature is affecting this. I'm going to move this down as a slicer horizontally. There we go. Now, notice what it does. Now, it says relationships may need to be needed here. So I want to hit Create, and it's going to try to deduce a relationship for me. Now, sometimes it's good at doing it, and sometimes it's bad. In this case, it cannot detect a relationship, and there's some reasons why it can't detect that relationship. In this case, when it tries to detect that relationship, it first of all, looks at the foreign keys, oh, can't find anything on the foreign keys. Next level is actually to look at the, data, the column names and correlations in the data itself. So in the data itself, is there a relationship? Am I seeing the northeast word over and over again in my fact table? If I can't see that, then I'm going to get the error that you just saw right there. So let's figure out how we can create that relationship. So in other words, I need to somehow find a way to tie this word northeast over to my fact table over here. Now you may see here I've got something in this northeast for a given month. So over here I have got a sales territory ID somewhere. Here it is. Now if I look at that sales territory ID, I'll see that it actually ties to my sales territory column here where I've got the word northeast. So I'm almost there, aren't I? I've got the word northeast. Also, I've got, oh, we're back in my, my fact table again, I've got this uh, order date again, 
Okay, so order date has it somehow ties to this dim date, which has a month number here also. So between the two columns, we'll somehow find a way to concatenate the two columns. I can create a single primary key that kind of ties these two tables together. So let's start with our temperature area. Remember the rule was that you can only have a relationship between one column. You can't do northeast to, and this points into there. So our way around this instead is to ultimately create a concatenated column. So I'm going to do the equal sign here and I'm going to say I want this column and percent this column to be joined together. So I'm basically deriving a brand new column with an and percent. And I'm going to call this column, uh, let's do this one, call this one temp key. Now this is called the DAX language, D-A-X, the data expression language. So this data expression language is a really handy language. It took the best parts of Excel and the best parts of MDX and kind of brought them together. So if we had to concatenate data, oh, so, okay, uh, try, so James is asking a question here. If we, if we, if we have to concatenate data, couldn't we have a, uh, couldn't we be a sign that we should have this to change the database design? Absolutely. Now keep in mind, in this case, I have no database. In this case, I have no key, no primary key at all. So that would be absolutely the case if there was a database. I got this data from the web initially. And all it had was northeast and the month number and what the temperature was. But it did not have any kind of primary key for that, for that given slice of data. I absolutely should have that. Now, over my fact table, I need to create the same thing. But you notice there's no word northeast. I instead have things like sales territory ID. And this is a foreign key. So if I want to concatenate this data, I could do equal sign again. Now, we can do the word concatenate as a key word that we can do. Uh, it's concatenate. That's a pretty handy word. Um, it, help, it helps us. We can use an and percent, or we can do concatenate. Concatenate. Now, notice how it writes a word for me. I hit, I hit the uh, tab, and it does all the work for me. Now, in my case, I want to ultimately kind of navigate the primary keys here, or for the foreign keys. I want to go from the foreign key in this back table to a column in a different table that you saw down here. So, in other words, I want to go to a related table. And from that related table, I want to go over to the, the DIM geography, I believe, or the DIM uh, sales territory, and I want to get its region. I'll hit tab, and again, it wrote all that code for me. I'm going to close parentheses there. I'm going to do a comma, and I'm going to get the related word again. This time, though, I'm going to go to DIM date, and I'm going to go to oop, DIM date. I'm going to pick uh, my English month number. Now, it'll let you write some bad code here, so I'm going to try my best here to, to do it for memory. Hit enter, and hopefully we don't get an error. Let's see. Oh, bum, 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 bum. All right, so I was really close, but I think I have some, some, some parentheses problems here also. Uh, looks like related, month, number, year. I always do this. Okay, it looks like I, I did not close the uh, outward parenthesis here. So I have this open print here that I forgot to close. Notice it's highlighting it for me, so I can see that I've made a mistake that I wasn't paying attention to before. So when I hit enter, let's try again. It's navigating the primer, the, the relationships in this power pivot area, and hopefully, come on, my laptop, laptop has too much stuff open right now, I guess. Hopefully in a second, it will connect with an answer. So my hard drive is going a little crazy right now. Normally it's going to be much, much faster, but it's because I have a lot of stuff open behind the scenes. All right. So this DAX language is kind of the best of all worlds, and we have some questions right now. Um, let's see here. How does how do we handle data security here? What a great question. This is from from Anand. So, wow, what in the world is going on here? This only takes like a second and a half normally. Okay, so to this data security question, if I were to email Anand this this spreadsheet right now, it would have a part of the spreadsheet would be all the data that makes up that report. So I could potentially have quite a problem right now. So instead of doing that, what I can do, that's where SharePoint really comes in handy. If instead if I were to publish this to SharePoint, then all the SharePoint security comes comes over with it. Also, now of course if I if I didn't have access to data source, then I would not have access here also. I would not be seeing these this this data. So there's, there's security on that side, but if I emailed Anon this spreadsheet, he has access to implicitly 
to the, to the uh, data sources until he hits the refresh button. If he hits the refresh button, all is lost because he didn't have access to that data source. Okay. Um, okay, wow, some great questions here. I've already got about 100 questions. Now, I'm not sure why in the world it's taking so long. I'm going to try to hit the escape key, and it's still not flying. Okay. For some reason, my hard drive is just dying right now. Let me do this. Brian, you want to hand with the questions, or you seem to be rolling, so I didn't interrupt you. Oh, no problem, Tim. Let's, okay. Let me close these spreadsheets here while, while, I'm, while I'm thinking here. And that should hopefully free up some resources. I'll hopefully tell you one thing I'll, I'll share with the audience, too, that we do here at Pragmatic Works that we found valuable with PowerPivot is uh, using it for commissions. Uh, I don't know how many of you have to support your sales teams with commission reports, but PowerPivot was, was excellent for that here. Yeah, the so this is a great one. question here. Is it a free product? It is. It, it is. Uh, if you have Excel 2010, it is a free product. So it's not free, but it's no additional cost. I'm not sure why that took so long, uh, but it finally came back. You know why? Because I, I went too low of a grain. I, I think over here, let's, let me double check real quick. Northeast, Central. No, no that, that's right. Germany. So I'm not sure why that took so long. Normally it takes about a second and a half to run. But it eventually came back. All right, and we have Australia 7, you know, so it's the seventh month in France. So in July in France, we know the temperature now. All right, um, I, I can't answer the question about Tableau's functionality. It gets you, it's, it's really, really close, but I can't answer that question, unfortunately, um, to, to get that intelligently enough to do that. So let me go back over to our report again, and let's see how our data looks. So I had, uh-oh, where did my report go? There it is. Okay, there's my report again. I'm going to hit the refresh button again. All right, see, it still can't find the relationship. I'm going to hit the create relationship. Now, let's see if it finds it this time. Keep in mind, there's no foreign keys this time. We're gonna, oh, it found something, it looks like. It is now creating that relationship, I hope, and it's done. So this time, now that the data correlates, it's able to kind of find the relationship. And now if I hit 42.2 degrees, it's able to see what kind of sales we have on these days. That's pretty cool, isn't it? So if I go back over to Power Pivot window again, the relationship that got created ultimately could also have been created by right-clicking on this name and hitting uh, uh, Create Relationship, which is right, oh, it's already been created here. See, Create Relationship is grayed out. So if I wanted to look and hit Create Relationship, I decided where my, my lookup table's at, I point the column that where it's at, hit Create, and it's done. I probably should rename this column to make it something you know, consistent, call this one temp key also. But even though the columns didn't match, it was smart enough to decide the relationships. Really, really handy stuff there. So we now have something that's intact, that report that we can use. Unfortunately, the report is, is way too granular, isn't it? So what I probably need to do instead is kind of roll this data up into a cold day, warm day kind of scenario. So let me hop back, back over here again, go back to temps. Now I'm going to paste in a formula that I have. Now this formula is on, my, is on my blog also, but it's fairly simplistic. All it is is an if-then statement. So I'm going to let me kind of zoom in here so you can see a little closer. So all I'm saying is the average temperature is less than 40. Now to me, that's cold. I know it's not in Boston, Tim, but for me in Florida, that's pretty darn cold. If it's less than 55, we'll call that cool. Well, that's, that's cold for me also, but uh, that's okay. And if it's less than 70, it's warm, and otherwise it's going to be hot. So we're just doing a big old if-then clause. So when I hit enter right now, so I, I, this is something that's not new to Excel at all. That's, that is a DAX language, but it is not new at all. Let's call this column, uh, maybe call this temp, key, temp average, something like that. Oh, there we go. I'll call this maybe uh, something like temp average or temp range. Okay, so now let's go back over the report, and now we can get much more granular, or not, less, less granular. We kind of roll the data up. We kind of bucketed the data, and let's get rid of the temp average temperature. Instead, let's put the temp range in, and now we can see, are we making more sales on cold days versus warm days? So you see my sales kind of jump around now? Now we can also move this, move this around as well. So if I, if I click inside here, uh, I want to move this down to the, the, there we go. I like that a little better now. Oh, where'd it go? I thought I moved it here. No, it is there. Temporary. Oh, where's my cold days? It must be up here. I, I might have found an interesting little quirk here. Let me move it down below here. 
for some reason it's not oh row labels no wonder <laughs> all right I'm, I'm sure there's a hundred people in my bot my chat window right now saying what the answer was there all right so if I move the slicers here we'll see it this way as well so a lot of ways we can do that so pretty interesting so far I think but we can do better than this I ultimately want to see how many orders I have on a given day so I could have had more orders on a warm day than cold day. So it's not, I may have had more cold days than warm days. So it's not necessarily fair for me to check the order, the order column here. So I have sales amount, let me uncheck that. And if I were to check something like order quantity, it may not be comparing apples to orange, apples to apples here by doing this. I might have had more cold days than warm days. So as I check these, you'll notice cool days I have 16,000. Hot days, I have you know 39, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it'd be nice to know what was the average orders on cool days versus warm days. So we can kind of compare more apples to apples. So this is where the question we had earlier about where does MDX go and where does this go? DAX is really handy language. So if I go back over to here and I select new measure, I'm going to create a brand new measure, and I'll call this one. How about I call it uh, something like? Average orders, well, let's, let's call it, yeah, let's call it daily orders, something like that. Now, in this case, again, it's going to write the formula for me. The, the rule of thumb is this. This table name that you see right here has to be your, your fact table, the highest, the, 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 the lowest grain is at. And then after that, everything you can relate to everything else that you want to. So if I call this one daily orders, I'm going to sum up the, I'm going to sum up the order quantity. Okay, there we go. Somewhere in here, I've got order quantity. So I want to sum that up, and then I'm going to divide that by the number of days I have. So count the number of days in uh, a given slice. So in, in my uh, fact table. So how many cold days do I ultimately have, in other words? So to do that, I'm going to use a distinct clause, and I'm going to go to my fact internet sales, and I'm going to try to get all the order date keys. There we go. Again, the code for this, it's all on my blog. So let me check the formula here. Okay, I can't believe I wrote that right the first time. So again, all I'm doing is I'm ultimately saying, all right, give me the distinct amount of my order keys. So how many days do I have in my fact table? Count those days and divide that by the, or, by the total amount of order quantity. So that should tell me apples to apples, do I, how many orders a day am I getting by category? So let me get rid of my, my it's right here. And notice I can also right click on this. I can say, well, I want to summarize that different ways. I want to summarize that by averaging it, by maxing it, show me the maximum number of days. See what's over here to summarize. See all the different, uh, you can't see on the screen right now, it says as count, min, max, and average. So it kind of gives you all kind of interesting data like that also. Let's get rid of that. So now we can kind of compare apples to oranges now and come up with a, an interesting answer. So we can see, all right, are cold days better than warm days? Well, let's see. Cold days are about 32.43 sales. And on cool days, 20.19. Hot days, 11.6. And, oh, we'll say warm days are almost the best. So warm days or cold days are almost the best for our sales. Could be happenstance, could be not. But it's an interesting way of kind of seeing the data here. Now, you'll also notice in the, in the PowerPoint window that you can do a lot more things in here as well. So if I were to go to dim date, for example, and say, well, how many sales did I get on this day? Or if I want to go to, to my, I want to flatten the data a little bit maybe, and I want to go over to my sales territory, and I want to figure out how many customers I have in a sales territory. All I have to do is go equal sign, and I want to count the customers, right? So what I can do is I can do count, count rows. This is an interesting one. And I want to count the rows for a related table, and it's going to be dim customer. Because there's already relationships in place when I hit enter, it's going to count the, count the customers, and in this, this case, there are no relationships between these two tables. That's why it's giving me the same number over and over again. But if there was a relationship in place, we'd be able to distinguish that. So, for example, if I were to add a new table, I want to add like a geography. It's smart enough to recognize that. So it's really, some really good stuff we can do that. So if I want to count the sales in a given territory, I can do something like this. I can say, all right, let's sum up those sales for a related table. Oops, I'm actually not in that cell. I want to sum up the sales for a given related table again. Let's try this again. The sum x is much like a sum function that you have in, inside of uh, T SQL today. 
I'm going to go to my Fact Internet Sales. And from that Fact Internet Sales, I want to get, how about we sum up the sales amount? Okay, let's make sure my close parentheses are right this time. And hopefully I got my close parentheses right. I did not. Okay, so open, open, close, and I'm missing close. I always do that, I swear. I'm missing close right there. There we go. Okay, so now we're seeing our sales now by this. Now we could have done this in the, in the, in the related tape on the uh, the pivot table also, but I just want to show you how you can kind of relate these tables together, how you can use some of these functions to kind of solve things that you couldn't solve before. Well, we're almost out of time, so I know I have a ton of questions piled up right now. There's one more thing I want to show, just to kind of show you can do it. To get to SharePoint now is as simple as going to File, Save and Send over to SharePoint. Now, once I do this, I can say I want to share this over to SharePoint right here, my shared documents. That will work. Now, it's actually going to time out because my, my server is down right now, which is okay. But it would ultimately pop up a window saying, do you want to publish just this sheet? Or do you want to publish all the sheets? So in another session, we'll cover much more about the SharePoint piece. Matter of fact, if you look in our archives, we have this already. Uh, this session already covered. It also saves the thumbnail of the spreadsheet also. After that, your users get access to all this data, all the slicing. It looks just like you guys see on the screen right now, but in a web browser instead. The one thing to note is when you click on 2007 the first time ever, it will take a few seconds the first time as it loads the OLAP cube behind the scenes uh, in SharePoint. After it does that, all the users get a very, very fast experience. There's also a way of locking it down and having SharePoint ultimately handle the refreshing of the data for you automatically. So SharePoint can schedule that refresh instead of you doing it manually instead. All right, we've got a pile of questions, Tim. Let's, let's jump into it now. And we've got about, uh, about three or four minutes left. So Tim, um, yeah. let's open this up now. So I'll take I have a great question from Lynn here. So All right. I used Excel 2010 with a plug-in. Uh, so you can use Excel 2010 to point to any data source you want to. Uh, it, can, it can be SQL Server 2005, 2000, doesn't really matter. But once you go to SharePoint, uh, SharePoint, to actually make the architecture work, has to have an analysis services 2010 bo uh, 2000, 2008 R2 box somewhere behind it. Uh, Tim, you want to ask some questions? Go ahead. Sure, yeah. I've got one here from Mary. I'm assuming you went down the list, Brian. I'm um, hoping you did that. Um, Let's see here from Mary, though. So how do you handle multiple dates on the same report, like filtering by post date versus date of service, since it cannot uh, handle multiple date keys? Yeah, so as far as the spreadsheet itself, no, you cannot. But once you get into the environment that you're looking for, the, the, the Power Pivot, it actually makes it a little bit easier. In the, in the, in the uh, Pivot Table portion, it makes it a lot easier to do that. All right, great. Hopefully that helps you out there, Mary. Hey, Jorge, how you doing? We've answered a few of yours. We'll go to you again here. Let's see. Power Pivot is basically doing dynamic MDX queries. Will performance always be this good, or is there a way to tweak queries for the performance improvement? Uh, great question, Jorge. Unfortunately, you cannot tweak the, perform tweak the queries that are happening behind the scenes. So it will not let you do that, unfortunately. All right, great. Going on to James. Uh, will you show us where the file that represents the work that the end user ah, has created is located? Great is question. Great question. So let me say this real quick. So. Right now, I, I want to say this is about a, behind the scenes, I want to say it's like a 400 meg, a 300 meg um, uh, of, of raw data behind the scenes in AdventureWR2. It's either 200 or 300 megs. Now, when I save this, I save it off to, oh, I, I, I overwrote my, uh, my example, but that's okay. So over here in the Power Pivot demo, you'll see it's about a 5 meg spreadsheet now. Now, I can email this to Lynn right now. And Lynn would have all the data she needs. All she has to do is hit that refresh button, and she'll get the latest version of the Power Pivot of, of the uh, uh, refreshed. And that's where SharePoint really comes in handy. So emailing Lynn a 5 meg spreadsheet, she's probably not going to be too happy at me. Oh, by the way, before we answer your question also, we have a special right now on training. So it's 4 95 for all of our classes. We do have a whole SharePoint BI class taught by Mark uh, Stacy. There's actually one seat now left, looks like. Uh, and that is uh, 4 95 and that is, actually covers the Power Pivot much, much more extensively as well. We're also doing a whole series of workshops all around the country for $1.99 right now. And those workshops are all around the country, New York, all over the place. And those workshops are, um, uh, we cover Power Pivot in there as well. Yep. All right, Tim, we have a lot of other questions? Yep, this one goes on to James. He's got a few here for you, but a good question here. If, if we have to concentrate data, couldn't that be a sign that we should have to change in the database design? Yeah, I covered that one a little earlier. Uh, 
in this case, we didn't have a, a database in this, in this case. Question from James is how much minimum RAM should we have for an end user? Uh, typically, at least two gigs. Uh, you probably want more like four gigs. However, I, I, I do this demo oftentimes on a netbook, and it works great also. It's just a matter of just knowing, you know, knowing what the uh, experience is going to be like. All right, all right. And, uh, of course, Sal was asking if it's a free product. The plug into Office is free. However, you know, you do need to have SharePoint, right, which is all, uh, that's where the cost comes in. I know you touched base on that earlier, but he asked again. Right, exactly. Tim, yeah. I think we're about out of time. Uh, let me uh, put my email address on the screen again. I keep on that the training is uh, going to be included as well. Uh, and my email address is right here, b9 at Pragmatic Works. I'm sorry I couldn't answer. We had have, we have close to 200 questions yeah. in our chat window here. I tried to get to all the ones I could, uh, but I thought was I was going to go under time, not over time. I, have, uh, I do have one, one final question for you, Brian, that um, sure. actually I'd like to clarify as well. Real quick, this one goes back to Selva. From the virtual labs perspective, he wants to know, uh, if we do our SharePoint labs, do they include Power Pivot, and is that included in our virtual lab here at Pragmatic Works? It is, yeah, yeah. So in, in our in a Pragmatic Works, we actually give you a virtual environment for, all for uh, our, our SharePoint BI class. And it, ha it does have power pivot. And yes, you got the whole configuration of that from an Excel perspective and also a SharePoint perspective. Great OK, question. so that's not, a, that's not a Microsoft thing, Selva. That's a pragmatic uh, virtual lab that's provided. And that's on our site under training under Mark Stacy. You can find that there. It's the one with one seat left. If you're quick, maybe, maybe you could grab it. And also, as Brian mentioned, that we do have a January special that uh, drops the price from $7.95 to $4.95. So that might be a real value for you. All right. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. And again, my email address is on the screen right now. I appreciate you guys coming today, and uh, we'll see you in future sessions. Thank you. We'll see, we'll see you Thursday. Talk to you later. Bye now.